baptized, there's a bright light all overhead, and everyone falls to the ground. Out of this light, there's a great voice that says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. He will be the King of truth, which shall lift this human race to knowledge. Well, Emmanuel rises and is immediately lifted up into this metallic light and ascends up into the sky. Emmanuel was not seen then for 40 days or 40 nights. He was taken by these guardian angels to a place, it says, between the winds of the north and the west to learn the secrets of wisdom. There he spent his days with the wise saints of God and the guardian angels. And let me just kind of refer to the old book here so I can get that part right. And I'll tell you a little bit about uh, uh, what's called the secret of Emmanuel is what it says in the writings here. He goes to this place, which it sounds like would probably be over in the area where Florida was, where the great gods and the celestial uh, angels actually lived. And there he learned the wisdom of God. He was met and introduced and educated by the guardian angels and the celestial sons. It says there he saw the forefathers, the saints of ancient times, who were the fathers of the human race, the celestial sons. And there he went north along the ends of the earth, where the metallic lights and fire vehicles fell out of the sky, with singing, covered with smoke and fire, and soared into the sky. He saw great marvels at the end of the earth. There a large door of heaven opened up, and he saw the three races of mankind. As big as the area of the sea near, near the river Jordan did the heavenly doors radiate, it says. Radiating inside was the entire land of Israel, alive and true. Behind this other, the door was no hidden secret, for the Sohar entered the smallest spaces, it says, of the cottages and revealed the last to be known. Then it mentions behind the second gateway to the sky there were grand mountains whose tops reached into the sky and disappeared into the clouds. The third heavenly port revealed a land of huge dimensions, mountains with rivers, lakes, and oceans, because there lived another human race. As I've said before, the god of that time ruled over the three human races that had been developed, which we remember earlier were primarily the Hebrew race, uh, the Indians around the Black Sea, and then the uh, developing brown skin race, the Indians of, an, of the American continent. So there he stayed. He went into the palace of God, which ruled over these three human races, and uh, met the celestial sons. God himself, he says, was immortal and ancient, the size of a giant like the celestial sons. Um, in the palace of God, there appeared to Emmanuel two very tall men, the likes like he had never seen before. He said their faces radiated like the sun, their eyes seemed like burning torches. Fire came from their mouths. Their clothing resembled a layer of foam, it says, and their arms were like golden wings. So surely this is where the concept and idea of the angels came about. It says in here that they lived in their own world because this world had killed them. These two men from the seven sisters, the Pleiades, were sacred teachers, together with two smaller men who said that they were men from Bawi, B-A-A-W-I. And you'll remember from Billy's contact notes that the Bawi on some occasions uh, were aiding the Pleiadians even here on earth. So this is where Emmanuel got his education. During those 40 days and 40 nights, he was taught the laws of creation. He was taught the laws of God and to understand nature. And most importantly, he was given his great abilities of healing and future vision that would serve him throughout all of his life. And through the... Um, rest of the Talmud, it is not entirely different <clears throat> than the Bible stories we've read, where he does healing and so forth, but in each story you find constant reference to the laws of God. Nowhere in here uh, does Emmanuel ever talk about being the son of God. He always attributes his father as being Gabriel of the celestial sons. And at no point in here does he call himself Jesus Christ. It's never mentioned in the book. And at no point in here does he ever revere himself as a redeemer, a savior of any type. But the book, it refers to his lessons, how he tried to teach people through parable, how to learn, how to think, how to develop truth for themselves. He spoke to them continually about the will of the Spirit, how to develop strong will through the laws of creation and the knowledge of Spirit. The stories of healing lepers and so forth are in here. Uh, in the house of Peter, where he uh, brings a woman back to life and so forth. 
the healing of the two possessed. He, uh, it's also in here all about the disciples. I've read this over several times, and again, it's fairly similar. Many of these stories to just as the Bible stories that you've read. It's a hundred pages long, and I don't wish to go through all of them right here. And I'll save you that for your own excitement when you can get a copy of the book, because I'm going to tell you where to get it here in just a moment. The other really fascinating part is when we get towards the end, when it explains all about the, uh, the crucifixion. And I, that part I know well, so let me tell you that part. Okay, we're going to move ahead to the Last Supper. And uh, where Emmanuel spoke to one of his disciples, and he tells him to go into the city to a certain person and tell them that I want to have the Last Supper with my disciples at his home, for behold, Easter is near. Which they do. They have the Last Supper. And, of course, the most importantly here is that this is where Emmanuel explains to the, uh, his disciples of the great heavy time that is on him that he will be crucified and that he will be lying dead in this state uh, for three days and three nights, where again he shall rise uh, from the dead. And they have a toast. He says, all of you drink from this cup. Your throats are thirsty. Also on rainy and cold days, it says. They then, after the dinner, they go to Gethsemane. Uh, which is the area where he's to be captured later that night. And that's a very difficult time for him. Uh, interesting reading in here, it talks about how now, even though he knows he must fulfill his mission, because it is written so, it's the will of God, as to not to mention there's going to be a great learning in this also for him. But uh, this is the part where he really breaks down, and you feel how human he really was, because he's about to face a terrible ordeal of bodily pain. And which will be inflicted by all of these wild, crazed people. And it does happen. So all of his disciples are bedding down, going to sleep, and he's waking Peter up, and he wakes Judas up. To He doesn't want to be alone because he knows of the terror that's about to happen to him, and he's trying to keep his strength together uh, to face up to what's about to happen. Well, it does happen. Uh, Judah I. Harriet comes. And uh, he has a, a group of men with him who come to take uh, Emmanuel away, which they do. And they take Emmanuel back into town, and he's presented before the high priest who, of course, used the stolen uh, scriptures of Judas Iscariot to um, maintain that he's blasphemous and that he's gone against the uh, will of their God, and so he must be killed. So after the high council, uh, and the high priest, of course, you know, that was kind of a rigged deal, they... <laughs> They, they, they immediately are wanting to sentence him to death, but they can't just do that on their own, so they have to take him before Pontius Pilate, who is the governor. And like we've read in the Bible and our stories and so forth, Pontius Pilate really found no guilt in the man and actually begs Emmanuel to step forward and defend himself, which he does not do. So um, Pontius Pilate would actually kind of like to see him go free. And as is the custom on Easter, he always brings out two or three of the uh, prisoners to the open crowd and lets the crowd decide what the fate would be. Well, on this particular day, it says in here that the crowd was a little rigged, that the, uh, the members of the high priest and so forth had plants in the audience, and many people have been paid uh, gold and so forth to yell for the life of Emmanuel. And they did. They yelled, let him be crucified, let him be crucified. And no matter what Pontius Pilate could say to them, they insisted upon it. Well, Pontius Pilate washed his hands in front of all of them. He did not want to be responsible, he said, for, the, for this innocent man. Well, the crucifixion went just as we really had heard. He had been drugged out to the crucifixion. Uh, Billy told me one of the things that's not commonly known, though, is that most of the bones in his body were already broken. He'd been beaten so much on the back that his uh, ribs, cage, and so forth was busted up very poorly. So he must have been in tremendous pain at that time. So he's put on the cross. And, of course, he's uh, you know, taunted and yelled at and so forth. If you're such a great uh, king of wisdom, whatever, why can't you get yourself off the cross? There's a tremendous storm which lasts for about three hours while he's still on the cross. Uh, and after that time, it looks like he's just...